Hey, welcome again to another story in the series of Blazing the West. I'm Kathy Drew, owner and creative director of Interactive Entertainment. Today's story is one of my absolute favorite legends of history, Calamity Jane. Martha Jane Canary did come to California a few times, mostly you know you know about her from Deadwood. But what a Wild West character that woman was. We hope you are enjoying our stories, continue to follow along. I don't know that I should be standing in front of a church representing Martha Jane Canary, but sit back, relax, and enjoy the story of Calamity Jane and how she got her name. Well, howdy. My name is Martha Jane Canary, but you can call me Jane. Some add the calamity, and I'm okay with that, too. I've been asked to tell my story. What there is, I can tell. I was born May 1st, 1852 in Princeton, Missouri. My father was Robert Wilson Canary, a man who loved his gambling to the point of it being a problem, and my mother's name was Charlotte. I was the oldest of six children, which held its own responsibilities, two brothers and three sisters. I can't remember when I wasn't outdoors enjoying nature and began riding horses at an early age. I was 13 when my father moved us by wagon train to Virginia City, Montana. It wasn't going to be the longest and most difficult trip I would take, but it weren't easy. During the five months of travel, I spent most of my time hunting with the men until my mother died of pneumonia when we got to Blackfoot, Montana. A lot of folks on that wagon train died, and we just buried them along the way. I had to help take care of the younger kids, but still kept up on my shooting skills and became a pretty dang good markswoman and a fearless rider. Well, we no sooner got to Virginia City, but my father decided to move us to Salt Lake City, Utah, in the summer of 1866. I don't think traveling were good for us because my father died shortly after getting to Salt Lake City. I was eight, I was only 14 years old and now the head of the household. I hooked up with a wagon train going to Wyoming and arrived in Fort Bridger on May 1st, 1868. I took whatever job I could find to provide for myself and the youngins and I worked hard as a cook, a nurse, dance hall girl, dishwasher, waitress, and even an ox team driver. People started saying I acted more like a man than a woman. Well, except for the dance hall girl. <laughs> I was rowdy, adventurous, and it was said I grew up to look and act like a man, shoot like a cowboy, drink like a fish, and exaggerate the tales of my life. I had a hard life, and I survived everything thrown at me. In 1870, I met an army general named George Armstrong Custer, and he hired me as a scout at Fort Russell, Wyoming. I put on the uniform of a soldier and was made mistaken for a man consistently. Heading south, we traveled to Arizona to put the Indians on river reservations, and once again, I rode hard and shot fast. In 1872, I returned to Fort Sanders, Wyoming, and was ordered out to the Musselshell Indian outbreak. That campaign, I worked with General Custer, Nelson Miles, and George Crook, on the, and the work lasted until 1873. I was in Goose Creek, Wyoming, where the town of Sheridan is now located. And Captain Egan was in command of the post, and the troops were ordered out to settle down an Indian uprising. When the soldiers were headed back to camp a couple days later, we were ambushed by Indians. Captain Egan was first to get shot, and I turned in my saddle, rode back fast, and hard and caught him before he fell to the ground, lifting him onto my horse and galloping him back to the fort. He said to me, I name you Calamity Jane, the heroine of the plains. I have borne that name since. In the spring of 1874, I was ordered to Fort Custer and then on to Fort Russell, where I had to stay put until the spring of 1875. Things were pretty quiet for a while. Then the troops were ordered into the Black Hills to protect the settlers and the miners who were arriving for the gold discovered up there. We were to protect them from the Sioux Indians as they were traveling to Fort Laramie. I was ordered to go north with General Crook in the spring of 1876 to join up with General Miles, General Terry, and Custer at the Bighorn River. I was to deliver dispatches from General Crook to a local outpost which required me to swim the Platte River near Fort Fetterman. Well, I got the fever and was sent back in General Crook's ambulance to Fort Fetterman and I was in the hospital for 14 days believing I was going to die. But I recovered and headed to Fort Laramie and then on to Deadwood, South Dakota when I met the most handsome man in the world, 
Wild Bill Hickok. We hit it off immediately, and me, Charlie Utter, and Wild Bill were like the three amigos. I was in love. And even though folks have said none of this ever happened, including some of my troop adventures, I'm here to say that I love Wild Bill Hickok, and he loved me. When I got to Deadwood in June of 1876, I took on a job with the Pony Express, carrying the United States mail between Deadwood and Custer, which was a distance of 50 miles over the roughest trails in the Black Hills. I was out on a mail ride on August 2nd, 1876, when my beloved Bill was sitting at the gambling table in Nuttall and Man's 66 Saloon in Deadwood, one of our favorite watering holes, when he was shot in the back of the head by that no good dirty snake, Jack McCall. Bill was holding a pair of eights and aces, and it would be forever known as the dead man's hand. Bill's funeral had the entire population of Deadwood show up, and he was buried up on Boot Hill. McCall said he shot Bill in revenge for killing his brother in Abilene, Kansas. I called him a no-good chicken-livered coward to his face after he was found not guilty because something about jurisdiction and Deadwood being an Indian territory. Well, I heard he was hung in the spring of 1877 in Yankton, where he was tried and found guilty. I stayed in Deadwood for a while doing some prospecting when the smallpox plague struck. I nursed a lot of people back to health, and I worked with Doc Babcock, who called me an angel in a hard-boiled egg. Well, now, I still had my calamity and cantankerous ways about me. The lard players came to town, and me and my friend Arkansas Tom were enraged at the end of the play and let fly a long stream of tobacco juice, which hit the star square in the eye and dribbled down her dress. It started gunplay, but the crowds cheered us on as we marched arm in arm out the door and down the street. I heard Tom was cut down in a bank stick up at the following day. I was riding to Crook City in the spring of 1877 when I came across the stagecoach coming from Cheyenne and being chased by Indians. I pulled alongside and found the driver lying face down in the boot hole of the stage, shot with an arrow. I took the driver's seat and drove the coach into Deadwood carrying the six passengers and wounded driver to safety. I don't remember if I got any thank yous, but it don't matter. Well, in the fall of 1877, I went on to Bear Butte Creek with the 7th Cavalry. They were building Fort Meade near the town of Sturgis, and I hung out there until 1878 when I went on to Rapid City and tried my luck at prospecting. There were some magazine and book writers who were hunting me down in the late 1870s who had heard my stories. One of them dime novels had the nerve to call me the White Devil of Yellowstone. I took off to Miles City in 1882 and bought me a ranch on the Yellowstone River, settling down and raising stock and cattle, and had a small inn for guests. But I got restless and went to California in 1883 because I was curious, and then on to Texas in 1884. It was in El Paso I met Clinton Burke, a real Texas man, and married him in August of 1885. On October 28, 1887, I gave birth to a baby girl, and we left Texas in 1889 for Boulder, Colorado, where we bought a hotel until 1893. Restlessness kicked in again, and we pretty much traveled through Wyoming, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and South Dakota, and I would sell my life story to anyone who would listen. In 1895, a man named Buffalo Bill Cody contacted me to join his show, which I did. I performed sharp scoop shooting skills astride my horse and things were good until I got to Kansas City where I find myself fired for being drunk in the streets. Liquor was my downfall. By 1900 I was in New York and hired by the Pan American Exposition with a good job and pay. But I once again succumbed to the horrible devil alcohol and was run out of town. In 1903 I returned to the Black Hills for the last time. I stayed with my friend Madame Dora Dufresne in Belfort and earned my keep cooking and doing laundry. I died on August 2, 1903 in a back room of the Callaway Hotel in Terry, South Dakota. I was 51 years old. My dying wish was be, to be buried next to the love of my life, Wild Bill Hickok, on Mount Moriah overlooking the town of Deadwood. My coffin was attended to by a man whose life I had saved during the smallpox epidemic when he was a boy. On September 6, 1941, 
the U.S. Department of Public Welfare granted old age assistance to a Jean Hickok Burkhart McCormick, my first daughter. You see, old Wild Bill and me had married at Benson's Landing, Montana in 1873, and we signed our names in a Bible in front of a minister and a couple of witnesses. This story has been challenged since then because no one was left to confirm the story. I gave Jean up for adoption to a Captain Jim O'Neill when she was born because I knew I was no kind of mom to raise a child. When I died, several letters to Jean were found in my belongings to explain why I left her behind and who her father was. I'm Calamity Jane, an American Frontiers woman, Army Scout, and legend. Thank you for listening to my story. Hi, I'm Rebecca McCollum and I play Calamity Jane for Interactive Entertainment. Thank you for listening to my story and for more stories, follow Interactive Entertainment on Facebook and YouTube, Blazing the West.